The lecture will also discuss the retreat of Caribbean thought in the context of the Washington Consensus and identify the current developmental issues requiring critical thought. Before I give Dr. Weta the floor, I would first like to introduce him briefly. Michael Weta was employed by the University of the briefly. West Indies, UWI Mona, for more than 40 years. First in the Department of Economics and more recently as a senior research fellow at the Sir Arthur Lewis Institute of Social and Economic Studies. During these years, he also has been visiting professor at several US universities and served as a candidate to the National Planning Agency since renamed the Planning Institute of Jamaica. His research interests have ranged broadly across development problems such as economic growth, exchange rate management, poverty, food, culture, energy, labor, youth, and climate change, and also across sectors such as agriculture, the informal economy, housing, and tourism, across small island developing states, primarily in the Caribbean, but globally as well. His most recent research projects are on the greening of the Caribbean economies as a strategy for development and the implementation of the Sustainable Development Goals. I would now like to ask Dr. Michael Witter to deliver the fourth annual Samoyo Memorial Lecture on the topic Caribbean Economic Thought, Advances, Retreats, and Current Challenges. Thank you. Well, Sam, Sam Moyo, I must tell, begin by saying how happy I was to have met him. But at the same, and to the same degree, sorry that I did not know him and his work very well. And I am particularly grateful to Paris Yeros for sharing that special celebratory volume, Rethinking the Social Sciences with Sam Moyo. And now I feel like I have always known him, click. And the more I read this volume, the more I appreciated the honor of this invitation to participate in some summer school and to offer some ideas to support the continuation of his work. Click, click. So what I plan to do today is I want to begin with my personal exposure to some of the African intellectual roots that I am sure Sam shared, if only indirectly. Click. And I want to review briefly what I regard as the critical tradition of Caribbean economic thought. I am a bit wary about doing that because it is um, far more complex than I'll be able to present today but perhaps we can explore some of the nuances of what I say in the, in the discussion. And then I will address briefly the retreat from critical thought in the Caribbean in the face of neoliberalism. And it has occurred to me in thinking about this that the retreat is not, has not only been in the Caribbean. And to that extent, the efforts by some to, to develop and to propagate the critical perspectives on the, the development problematic is even more commendable. And then I end with posing challenges that I see to re-engaging a critical tradition and addressing the current issues that the Caribbean faces. And I'm using the Caribbean in, in several ways, and I don't distinguish them. I hope the audience picks it up. But on one hand, it is a metaphor for the larger issues of development that we share. But on the other hand, it is quite specific um, in terms of the reality that I am familiar with. Okay, go ahead. And in that process, I want to demonstrate the, the parallels to with Sam's intellectual struggles uh, in, in, in my interpretation of him as a partisan for economic development. Next slide, please. I begin with my African connections. I was a graduate student at the University of Wisconsin in Madison in the 1970s. I was a graduate student in mathematics. Next, next. <laughs> 
uh, at that time, the United States was cultivating African students. So what they did was they brought over a lot of uh, middle to senior level technocrats and bureaucrats from all over Africa, funded by the US um, AID. Uh, it was part of a, a move to respond to the Soviet Union's uh, various education programs for African students. Uh, a linchpin of that program was the Fulbright Fellowship of the, um, the US government offered to third world students in general. But at the time they were paying particular attention to the African students. And at the University of Wisconsin in Madison was a major focal point, uh, particularly what it called it, its land tenure center that spoke to agrarian development and the political science department. It happened that in Madison was where A.C. Jordan, the South African and his wife Phyllis had essentially gone into exile because of um, apartheid in South Africa. Uh, when I got there, uh, Mr. Jordan had already passed, uh, but Phyllis, his wife became like a mother to all of us. In fact, the Jordan's home was like our host family for, I keep saying us, for the African students, but I and a few other Caribbean students um, fell into that group and was embraced warmly um, by um, Mrs. Jordan. I point out here though that um, A.C. Jordan was a friend of the South African author Peter Abrahams who passed in the last couple of years. Peter came to Jamaica around independence. He had actually come with the uh, on behalf of the British Colonial Office to do a report on the colony of Jamaica's 300th anniversary. Uh, fell in love with the place. He had been ex in exile in, um, from South Africa. And uh, he came 1962, in the year of independence in Jamaica, settled and made it his home. Uh, my father was a journalist at the time. So, uh, they became friends, he and Peter became friends, and so the families got together. And it is from Peter Abrams that I first learned about apartheid in South Africa. Uh, this is the, the early 60s when I was a, a, a young teenager. At the University of Wisconsin, I had the privilege of knowing many, many important African um, personalities. I, I can think of a few now who have been in touch with or I'm aware of their existence. Uh, principal among them would be Okello Uchuli, the Ugandan poet and author of, of, of the book, The Orphan. Uh, there is Angola Talaja of the Congo, uh, it was Zaire then, uh, who recently had a piece in the, in the Guardian on Lumumba. My friend John Dube of Zimbabwe, who I lost touch with, and I was hoping that if I got a visit to Zimbabwe, I, I had visited once very briefly on a UN mission. Uh, I don't know what ever happened to John, but he was a character in search of a script. I would love to have um, met up with him again. And then later at Stanford, I did some work at Stanford. I, I met Jacques de Pelchon, also of, of the Congo, who is pretty well known. Um, in, in political science circles. Next slide, please. Next. Mm -hmm. uh, and for us, we had a continuous reasoning on issues of colonialism, Pan-Africanism, African liberation, and social and economic development in general. Almost every night we met. I was a mathematician. He, here were political scientists and economists. So it really titivated my fancy. I learned a, a hell of a lot about the continent and because of the issues that they posed outside of my discipline, it forced me to broaden my understanding, do a lot more reading, and eventually I would leave mathematics and end up in economics some years later. Next slide. Next click. Uh, in 1974, I returned to Jamaica. Actually, my plan then was to leave my young family in Jamaica and to, to go on to the, what was then the University of Botswana, Swaziland and Lesotho, 
where I was to be based as a kind of, um, how should I put it politely, um, support for the ANC. I had become very involved in work with the ANC and um, several organizations that supported uh, African liberation struggles. Uh, but it turned out that the circumstances of my life did not allow me to leave my family there. And so I actually stopped in Jamaica and never made it on um, to the work that I had hoped to do. But it was a remarkably exciting time in Jamaica, I must point out. Uh, there was a lot of research being done into Garveyism and it, particularly its theme of Africanness and the need for uh, uh, Africans to you know, build their own homeland in Africa. A lot of work on African history, comparative studies, particularly led by the Ghanese uh, historian, Walter Rodney. Uh, Walter is very famous for having a visit in at Makerere in which he, there was a famous debate between him and Ali Mazrui, the, the Kenyan political scientist. Uh, he, one of his famous works was how Europe underdeveloped Africa and um, really activated the, the, the concept of underdevelopment uh, from uh, you know, a passive, passive voice. And then of course, there was a popular rise of African, is African interest in Africa and African consciousness led by the Rastafarians in Jamaica which it in turn had infused reggae music, which through Bob Marley was becoming very popular and was also another link between, between me and my uh, African colleagues who, you know, who were very interested in the reggae music. And it was a way in which we, we saw the cultural connections with, with, with among, us, among us. Next slide, please. Next slide. Joseph. Okay, so I want now to move to the section where I speak about the critical tradition. That's better. That's better, Joseph. Where I speak about the, tr the critical tradition. Uh, I, I wanted to give that background to point out that there was, there are these connections which in, in many ways, this lecture allows me um, to, to come like a full circle back to a period of my life that was very formative. So let's start with what we regard as the, the critical tradition in Caribbean economic thought. I'm only going to select the main um, points in that journey. And it begins with the work of W. Arthur Lewis, the St. Lucian, who was studying at London School of Economics in the 1930s, graduated in the same year as Keynes's general theory of employment, interest and money, the same year that was published, which gives you a sense of the intellectual climate in which he was a student. Uh, one of the things about the colonial experience is that young academics, very bright ones from the colonies would meet in the mother country. So just as Lewis would have met with many Afri young Africans who were studying in um, England, so too the French colonials would meet in Paris. And this created a, an intellectual ferment in which they sought to understand what was happening in their countries and thereby saw parallels and uh, commonalities. I point out to you that Lewis began his research with a study of economic history of the Gold Coast. And he actually became the first economic advisor to Nkrumah uh, when Ghana became independent in 1957. Next, click. We think that Lewis initiated the critical tradition of Caribbean economic thought because he was the first to lay a devastating critique of colonial development policy uh, that 
essentially confined colonies to primary agricultural products and left the processing and manufacturing in the mother country. So for example, Jamaica was to produce sugar, uh, Ghana was to produce cocoa, the cocoa and the sugar would go to England and Cadbury would make chocolate out of it. That was the division of labor that um, the colonial authorities uh, posited. And in the 1930s, there was a famous report done in response to a rebellion that had taken place in the Caribbean and in Jamaica in particular, in which this colonial development policy was articulated. And Lewis, the young scholar, um, wrote a blistering critique of it. I'll refer to it um, subsequently. Next click, please. Click. His most famous work, of course, of course, is the economic development with unlimited supplies of labor. Uh, that was written in 1950, I think, and subsequently developed into the famous book, Theory of Economic Growth in 1954. I want to give you this time period because this is just immediately after the Second World War, which comes immediately after the Great Depression, which in turn comes after the First World War. So that you have to see that between the First World War and the end of the Second World War, roughly about 40 years, uh, export developed export dependent countries like the Caribbean were totally cut off from world trade and that would have implications for um, the conditions of life in those colonies. I'll come back to that. Uh, Lewis in his work, however, economic development with unlimited supplies of labor, I pointed out that he graduated uh, when Keynes's work was published. And just by way of footnote, Keynes's work was um, anticipated by the Polish economist Kalecki in the year before. I doubt Lewis would have seen it then because it was in Polish, but eventually it was translated. So there was this intellectual ferment, ferment in which the state was to play this role in regulating capitalism. When he did his work though, Lewis adopted the approach of the classical economist by focusing on the accumulation process and hence the problem of economic growth. What he did was to use the familiar two sector model, Marx had called it a two department uh, model of an economy, next slide please, um, in order to, to grasp the structure of the, of the Caribbean economies. For, by way of background, he was very much aware of the labor rebellions in 1930s which were prompted by the poor economic conditions, as I mentioned, of, the, of the, the period where exports were, export income was lost because we couldn't export, either because people didn't have money in the Great Depression or war prevented the movement of goods. And because we didn't have those exports, that export earnings, we couldn't pay for the imports that we needed. So you had a lot of serious problems of first unemployment, but then there was hunger because basic foods were not available, especially because by then our colonies of several hundred years had become dependent on certain imported basic food items like wheat flour, for example, or dried cod um, fish from Canada, but also medicines. And so there was a lot of problems with disease and so on in the Caribbean and conditions were very bad. So all the way from Puerto Rico, right throughout the region, there were these labor rebellions in the 1930s. And it is in response to these labor rebellions that the British put forward this colonial development policy in which they were arguing that the colonies should expand their primary production in order to support the manufacturers in um, the mother countries. Next, click. Lewis himself as a young scholar was very influenced by the Fabian society, basically uh, social democrats. And it is, in the, it is on, in the context of that influence that he wrote what probably his first major economic work, which was Labor in the West Indies, the birth of a workers movement in which he gave an account of the, of the labor movement and the rebellion. 
So there you are, the problematic. The problematic immediately suggests a break from orthodox economics because he, he is he's trying to grapple with the conditions of, of the people from um, who gave birth to him in their expression as um, of the labor rebellion. Click, please. So Lewis is concerned primarily with poverty, which he explains or understands as the, as the result of unemployment. And that unemployment is itself a result of the economic crisis of the period. And as I suggest, he uses this two sector model following the classical tradition in which he divides the economy into what he calls a modern and a backward sector. Uh, modern must be interpreted as manufacturing and backward should be interpreted as agricultural. And the idea is that in the agricultural sector, there is this proliferation of labor, what he called an un, uh, unlimited supply of labor, this pool of unemployed labor, so that investment in the manufacturing or the modern sector would pull labor from the backward sector, from the agrarian sector, to produce manufacturers that were exported. In this way, investment in the manufacturing sector, next click, would provide, next click, investment in the man manufacturing sector would provide employment and income and the colony would earn foreign exchange by exporting the manufacturers. Next click. Workers in this model, workers in manufacturing would get a little bit more pay because one would have to provide them with whatever they were earning in the backward agrarian sector, plus a little margin to get them to move over into the manufacturing or the modern sector. And eventually, that labor pool would shrink, wages would also arise because of the increasing scarcity of labor in the backward sector, especially if there was investment in the backward sector to improve the productivity of labor there. Next click. Click. So where was the capital to come from for this um, investment? Since the colony had been exploited for so many years, there wasn't capital locally and therefore the capital was to come from abroad. The manufacturers were to be exported because the local market was too small, too poor, and could not absorb them. Click. Therefore, the policy implication was that government should provide incentives for capital to come from abroad to invest in export manufacturing. Actually, Lewis had seen this in his work um, on the Anglo-American Commission after World War II, he had seen that this in what Puerto Rico had successfully done with export manufacturing. Next click. So this work he did, economic development with unlimited supplies of labor is easily one of the most influential works in development economies, development economics, right? Literally hundreds of articles were spawned by it, critiquing it, developing it, mathematizing it, etc. And governments in Caribbean and elsewhere embraced its policy recommendations. I mean, even today, you can see the influence of Lewis's um, export-led um, um, investment in, in incentive for investment from abroad into manufacturing for export. You can still see that in public policy. And just for the record, Lewis got the Nobel Prize for this, and this work was probably the major reason. Uh, parenthetically, St. Lucia with about 100 people have two Nobel Prize uh, um, winners, uh, Lewis and Derek Walcott, who won it for literature. Really remarkable uh, um, achievement. Click. So Lewis had used classical and Keynesian ideas to debunk the colonial development theory in the interest of improving living standards of working people. I bear in mind that by then, neoclassical economics had shifted the focus away from the classical concerns with growth and development into looking at the allocation of scarce resources, static allocation, as a matter of fact, at a point in time. 
where optimum pricing became more important. Lewis was not using that framework, which was emerging as the dominant framework at the time and would later inform uh, neoliberal thought. Next slide, please. So Lewis's work then is um, become guides public policy right up to and through independence in the early 1960s, the period of political independence, especially from the British um, between late 50s and early 60s. But by the early 1960s, a new wave of thought emerges with a group that calls itself New World. It's a collection of all kinds of peoples, um, academics in and outside of the university, journalists, writers, artists, Thinkers, um, at the time in the colony, journalists were important part of the intellectual ferment um, in the region. And I even published a journal that was very critical of colonial society and particularly the colonial continuities into the newly independent Caribbean countries. One of the projects that we are trying to do now is to republish those, um, those journals um, online. Next click. That group was made up of primarily Caribbean people, but it included two important non-Caribbean people by birth. One was Kari Polanyi Levitt, originally from Austria-Hungary, uh, living in Canada, who parenthetically was tutored by Lewis in LSE um, just as soon as Lewis graduated. He got a tutorship there and she was in class, so she knew him personally. And Archie Singham, who was originally from Ceylon, now Sri Lanka, a political scientist. And both of them had a profound impact on Caribbean thought, bringing to bear their own experiences in the colonial world. Click. Carrie Polanyi Levitt is the daughter of Karl Polanyi of the Great Transformation, that famous European intellectual who well, perhaps made the most important critique of, of Marx's work. And eventually she, ended up, she made contact with the Caribbean after she herself had done her famous work, which was to study Canada as a monocrop export economy, exporting codfish in a work she called Silent Surrender. And in Silent Surrender, the focus of the analysis is on the price of the staple that is exported. In the case of Canada, it is cod. Anyway, she came to Jamaica, to Trinidad as a research assistant to look at the structure of the Trinidadian economy. And that brought her in touch with the, with the, um, the, the thinkers in the New World Movement. And eventually some of them who were studying at McGill University uh, made contact with her there too. So there was even a, a new world group established in Montreal as part of this process. Next slide, please. Singham was a political scientist, uh, very important in terms of shaping critical political thought about the colonial bureaucracy and political leadership. And again, he drew a lot from his uh, background in um, in, in Ceylon. Click. Now, the seminal critique of Lewis, they turned their attention to critiquing Lewis, the New World thinkers. That was their concern. Lewis's policy was dominating economic development and they turned their critique, their critical thoughts against Lewis's work and essentially ridiculed um, Lewis's work by calling it industrialization by invitation. Uh, in anticipation of what, uh, of what I will say next, next click please, uh, some of them have now uh, essentially recanted that view and said that it was quite disrespectful and um, uh, inappropriate because it misinterpreted what Lewis was saying. But at any rate, this notion of industrialization by invitation and political in, um, in, in Ceylon. I'm hearing my voice repeated. Okay, all right. Are you hearing me now? God's 
I can hear you. It's Walter who needs to because mute. Because it misinterpreted himself. what Luke. Okay. So as so I was saying, read. the New World thinkers characterized what Lewis was saying as industrialization by invitation. And they argued that his policies would reinforce the traditional dependence on foreign capital and export production, that he had been mistaken in following Puerto Rico because Puerto Rico was a part of the United States. So there was no problem getting its output into the US market. But as non-US territories, the British, formerly British Caribbean had problems exporting to the United States and um, the British market was distant and limited. And at any rate, these policies had not generated the jobs that were, were promised. Next slide, please. Next slide. Next slide, Joseph, please. Sorry, I'm facing a little challenge over here. I'm just sharing it again. Okay. My internet is a little unstable. When you get, can, when you can, please give me the next slide. Yeah, so basically we are, we are saying that um, the New World Group, these young thinkers in the early 1960s, economists, political scientists, sociologists, journalists, artists of very sort, various sorts, authors, they all um, turned their attention to, to critiquing Lewis uh, because they felt that the policies that had come out from his work had not brought about the promised employment um, that Lewis had projected. Next slide, please. Now that was a big wide ranging movement. I'm only going to send um, focus on the central thrusts that emerged from it um, at the time, but also in retrospect. And that is the work of those who call themselves plantation economists. Lloyd Best and, Car and Carrie Polanyi Levitt, who I mentioned, proposed the theory of plantation economy. Essentially, they came up with three models to model the slave economy, that was the case of pure plantation economy in the case of the Caribbean, but it obviously had implications wherever the plantation was used. Southern United States, Ceylon again, and you know, various parts of Latin America where they didn't really have plantations, but they had what were called haciendas. So that the focus on the plantation as a central institution was transferable to other economies where there was this central institution um, that connected the colony to the mother country and was engaged in various form of export activity. The second two models dealt with the period after emancipation uh, and they called them plantation economy modified, plantation economy further modified that took them up to Around, nine, around independence. And the idea was there was to be a fourth model of how would you transform the plantation economy into self-sustaining self um, independent economies. And that was never written. Next click, please. So stripped down, what the model did was to identify the plantation as the institution that dominated resources in the, in the colony, particularly land and labor. And it did so on behalf of the merchant houses in the metropole that financed it. Essentially, the merchant house supplied capital and inputs to the plantation. The plantation used these to produce and export and then sent that back to the merchant house. So whenever there, there was a problem with the prices of what the plantation exported, just like what Carrie had noticed in the case of the export of cod in Canada, there was an impact of the, the change of the terms of trade between what the colony exported and what it imported um, that revolved around the price of the export. 
And the adjustment mechanism that they saw was very different from the adjustment mechanism that was offered in neoclassical economics. In the case of the plantation economies, they saw that when the price of the export fell, the, the, econ the plantation economy adjusted by shedding labor re or reducing the returns to labor. In the case of slavery, it would, um, the period of slavery, that is the pure plantation economy, it was a reduction of rations. After slavery is emancipated and the economy is modified, the plantation is mo modified, then it is, they are paid wages, the ex-slaves are paid wages, and those wages shrink, workers are fired, and so on. So a, a, a reduction in the price of the export leads to um, adjustment that the workers, those who produce the export, bear. But if the price of the export goes up and the terms of trade is then favorable to the colony, increased profits accrue to the merchant house. Next slide, please. So it, I think it's important, and I mean, we had a lot, if we had more time, we could dwell on this quite a bit, is that the plantation as an institution replaced the notion of the, the, the concept of the neoclassical firm. In that the plantation was, the, the neoclassical firm, was seen as irrelevant in the plantation economy because the dominant production unit was the plantation. And the plantation served therefore both as a unit of analysis for um, production in the sense of microeconomics, but it also served for macroeconomic analysis because in their view, the plantation economy really was just a collection of plantations, very much like the the, um, the, the, the hive of honeycomb of a bee, where you know, there are all of these cells, identical cells besides each other. So, the, so each plantation was a microcosm of the society as a whole. Uh, people were born, grew up and died in the plantation. Um, the plantation impacted the culture of the society, shaped the language, etc. It had its own governance, its own military. So, this notion of plantation allowed them to analyze both the micro and the macroeconomics of, of those societies. Very important is that the plantation, um, the plantation reflected the class race hierarchy in the colony. Click please. Uh, Norman Gerwan, the late um, Professor Norman Ger Gerwan, extended these ideas to the post-independence mineral export dependent economies. That's like Jamaica producing bauxite, Trinidad producing oil, Chile producing copper, where he focused on the relations between the multinational corporation in the metropole, which was the modern version of the merchant house, and its branch plant in the hinterland, which behaved similar to the plantation, but were not really plantations themselves. And his focus was to show that trade between the branch plant and the multinational was really internal, was really a book entry within the corporation. And therefore the notion of the terms of trade that you would see in neoclassical economics and the his modern history of econ uh, modern economic history analytical um, framework uh, was misleading in the case of the colony because these terms of trade were really manipulated within the um, relationship of the multinational corporation headquarters and its branch plant in what he called the hinterland. By the way, the hinterland is what was the term reserved for the colonies in the model of the plantation economies. Next slide, please. So immediately, Gerbon's extension brought him in, brought that work in connection with dependency theory that was going on in Latin America, with, led by people like Theotonio dos Santos, structuralists like Osvaldo Sonkel, and eventually Samir Amin's center periphery view of global capitalism. And indeed, Gerbon spent a couple of years with, with, with Samir Amin in Dakar, developing these ideas. And that therefore is another important um, Caribbean African link. Uh, eventually, Sam 
would be would walk into those paths as well. Next link. Finally, in terms of the critical tradition, very briefly, there was a, a flirtation with Marxism in the early 1970s um, in the left politics of the CARICOM region. Um, I suppose you, I should have pointed out that I'm focusing more narrowly on the CARICOM Caribbean, that's the English speaking Caribbean, along with Suriname and Haiti, uh, because quite clearly Marxism played a very important role in Cuba, which is right next door to Jamaica. But I'm referring here specifically to the CARICOM region. Click. And it was particularly so in that the, the, the young Marxists found that the plantation economists had uh, overemphasized the importance of the institution and not looked at the class analysis, which would explain the dynamics of capitalism. And in that sense, had missed the content in, in, in respect in, in favor of the form of exploitation in the region. Indeed, they use the concept of exploitation without having the same definition as it had originally in Marxian theory. And in that sense, there was a sense of eclecticism, eclecticism about plantation economy, which the Marxists critique. Next click. And then there was also work on possible paths to socialism coming out of this, out of the Caribbean with it, um, as backward economies. I uh, recall that um, there were uh, many intellectual struggles around the concept of which society was ready for uh, socialism. Uh, most famously, the Chinese communists were denounced by some saying that they can't leave from a peasant society to go straight to socialism and of course those ideas in many ways applied to um, the backward sectors of the the global periphery such as in the caribbean click please and then it all ended bang uh, with the grenada crushing of the grenada revolution in 1983 uh, in retrospect, that's not the only place that the critical thought wound down in the region. It wound down in Latin America as well, but certainly the particular experience in the Caribbean was the Grenada Revolution. Once the Grenada Revolution was crushed, it seemed that uh, progressive thought just withered immediately. Next slide, please. So then we come now to the rise of neoliberalism. Uh, okay. The critical tradition, I think, succumbed to, to, twin, to the twin forces of the IMF and the World Bank and their international supporters in the global politics of the day. Click. It, sub, it um, succumbed as well to the Washington Consensus, much of which was shaped in the Caribbean as an experiment. Click. and US military might, click. I want to use the case of Jamaica because it is Jamaica that led the way into the debt trap for the Caribbean through a weakening demand for traditional primary products, click. In Jamaica's case, it was sugar and banana and those prices were going down. And um, there was, uh, uncertainty in the long run uh, profitability of bauxite alumina uh, for all kinds of reasons, not least of which the next one, rising energy costs, um, threatened the viability of that industry globally. Click. And then there were rising labor and social costs, which made goods from Jamaica in, in particular and the Caribbean uh, less competitive. Click. A word about weakening demand. It is important to see that Jamaica and the Caribbean were specialized for the center of the global economy. Indeed, indeed, the, the global economy, the world economy does not really exist until the Caribbean in the post-Columbian phase comes into existence. That is where the world economy starts around the triangular trade between Africa, um, the, between 
between outposts in special places in Africa, the entire Caribbean and, 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 um, and Western Europe. So the Caribbean was specialized for the global economy. And once the demand for the Caribbean exports started to weaken, it meant that globalization in its modern form was leaving the Caribbean. So that's very different from the case of countries that were not really in the world economy fully when globalization invades the indigenous economy and disrupts it. In the case of the Caribbean, we were specialized for the global economy and then the global economy started to leave us. Next, please. Energy costs. Well, basically the energy crisis de de uh, decimated the Caribbean economies with the exception of Trinidad that had a little uh, oil. Um, but for most of the rest of us, we, we, we could not um, cope with the rising um, energy prices. And this was a reflection, I think, of uh, reorganization of the global economy. We can discuss that afterwards. Next, please. And then the rising domestic costs. I pointed out to you that the workers in the region had rebelled in the 1930s. They were promised independence. That came about 20 years later after the rebellion. And then independence came and conditions were not that much better for the workers nor for the, the, the farming community, which remained landless. So there was a lot of frustration after independence that fueled industrial unrest by way of all kinds of strikes, you know, fairly well organized um, um, labor movement. And then uh, uh, along with the various kinds of left protests and black nationalist protests with the dissatisfaction of, um, of independence. In the case of Jamaica, you have to root the social critique of reggae music in this period. Click. So, all of it, that ferment led to Michael Manley's coming to power with a, a, a reform program for social democracy. And no sooner than that reform program began to be implemented, that the economy went into severe crisis for external reasons, as well as domestic reasons. My own view is that it was primarily external. Click. That led to, and how we were going to deal with that economic crisis, eventually split the, the ruling party and the movement around it. Uh, there were some of us who felt that the government should accelerate the reforms in order to deal with the economic crisis, for example, by accelerating land reform, as well uh, as opposed to those who favored getting the IMF to come in and have an adjustment program and so on. And essentially the progressive forces and the left in particular lost and um, the government went with the, the IMF solution. Click. So with the IMF, of course, comes its stabilization program, which has the same conditionalities as the work World Bank's structural adjustment program. The, con the consequences of that is that it deepened the debt of Jamaica it weakened the capacity of the state for social reform, click. It weakened the state's control of the economy by, by, by requiring it to deregulate markets, click. It strengthened the capacity of the state, however, to support capital, click. And it imposed austerity on the working people. And all of these things became tenets of the Washington consensus, click. And of course, with these policies came the politics that was um, consistent with them, that matched them, reflecting at the time, the era of Reagan and Thatcher. Next slide, please. As pointed out, the crushing of the Grenada Revolution had lasting effects on the psyche of Caribbean thinkers. Even today, you know, if you sit down with a group of um, people who were active during that period, and we begin to talk about what happened in that period, it, it, it's, it's really emotionally draining. I mean, you see people just crying, uh, unable to speak, uh, unable to come to grips with 
some of the horrible things that happened during that period, both as a result of, ultimately as a result of the external pressure, but also what, what happened internally as a result of that external pressure. It may explain the loss of confidence. It may explain the loss of belief that alternatives are possible. It certainly has a lot to do with fear. People were victimized and so on. But as I point out earlier, I alluded to earlier, we were not the only ones where the left movement kind of folded up its tents and slunk away into the background. And so that is an area that needs a lot of research. Here in the Caribbean, I'm telling you, it is very difficult to do it because the gener generation that was involved in it is too emotionally tied up and we really need uh, fresh eyes on, on what happened. Click. But what happened is that the university students of the 80s bought into the neoliberal view that Keynes was dead, that Marx was dead, the Soviet Union had collapsed, and uh, you know the pressure that they saw on the Cuba socialist economy was just too much. You know, it shut down all imagination of alternatives to the kind of development that we were pursuing um, under the IMF type of policies. Click. One of the things was that the students became quite enamored with economic modeling. The computers came along and it was not the torture that my generation of scholars had to go through where we did everything by hand. Nobody could just click the computer and you would get your, you know, correlation coefficients and so on. And the irony of it is that here are these sophisticated statistical and econometric tools which are being applied in a reality where there are no reliable or robust databases on the data that is required to make these models work. And whenever they did get data, their training didn't teach them to investigate the quality of the data, what the data meant. Their training told them that whatever they get, they just plug it into these models and outcome and result. So if I gave them rainfall data, they could, and then they did not know, they would have project, projected exchange rates, interest rates, anything that interested them. Quite bizarre. And I think this distracted a whole generation of intellectual energy away from the problems of development. Next slide. And with that came, as I said, no interest in development problems. They were just interested in finding uh, coefficients of correlation. Click. So what we had then, as I have outlined to you, 30 years of critical thought that um, is followed by 40 years of embrace of neoliberal thought, click. In a way, there is still an oblique criticism of capitalism in the Caribbean as elsewhere under the cover of the UN Sustainable Development Agenda. You know, there's work supported on MDGs, SDGs, green economy, climate change, all of which allow for looking at um, the bizarre outcomes of capitalist development, which the neoclassicals call externalities, etc. Click. But it does allow you to engage some of those um, issues to reveal the nature of capitalist society. Um, I, I myself have been, been involved in trying to engage young people's minds with issues that they confront. And you, you may have heard that I've worked in a whole range of areas, wherever there was interest, whether it was poverty, culture, energy, wherever it was that I could get them to think about things, but I'm not sure that it really um, stimulated their interest in the broader theoretical issues. Click. Yeah, so just a range of issues, you know, the critique of the IMF type policies, World Bank structural adjustment, anything that would make them to root, to link it back to the nature of capitalist development, but I, I don't think it was very successful. Click. So what are the current challenges? I think there's a lot to be learned from the early critical thinkers, certainly the issues that they address, poverty, equality, human development, they are, they're all still with us, click. But the world has changed a lot eh? since then. Um, there's been the obvious technological revolution, the 
repositioning of the, the, the change in the geopolitics of the world. Uh, climate change is now an issue we recognize. It's, I'm sure it was happening when I was a graduate student, we just didn't know. And now the first of what I believe will be a series of pandemics, which perhaps as more than anything else has paralyzed economies and societies everywhere, click. So in my view, the old development problems persist and know that there are new ones, but these new ones seem so overarching that Norman Gerben once pointed out just before he passed to that the Caribbean is facing an existential crisis. And this is literal. There are islands in the Caribbean that are expected to disappear under the seas in by the time we reach 2050s, 2060s. This, this is real. In addition to the social crises, the economic crises, and so on. Click. So I think that there is, I would like to encourage the young generation to revisit political economy, but to, in, to infuse in it the impact of the era of information and communication technology and the problematic of climate change. Click. That would require investigating the ways that capitalism has been differentiating itself, even re reinventing itself globally, but especially in the periphery where we live. And I think the central thing that we have to take account of is the way in which these accumulation processes have been shaped by monetary forces and speculative forces. This is quite different from the old political economy, which tended to deal with with the real sector of the economy, with, with, with material goods in which capital was embodied. Now we're talking about monetary forces and speculative forces. And the politics of that is, is, should be kind of obvious in that these are um, invisible uh, mechanisms of control of societies that um, are very hard to pin down. Click. I think it's going to be very important to, to review the, 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 the social relations um, with all their dimensions, class, gender, race, ethnicity, nationalist, nationalist, nationality, caste. Uh, they all characterize new forms of relations in capitalism. Click. In the case of the Caribbean, for us, class, race, and gender, we have to find a way to to, to reflect them, to, to broaden the, 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 the traditional classical political economy, to take account of these other dimensions. That is one of the areas that the Marxists tried to engage in um, at the end of the critical tradition. Click. And in particular, we now have to deal with how working people are being transformed into little business persons micro, small, and medium-sized entrepreneurs all linked in with big capital, click. So it seems to me, for example, that in the era of information communication technology, the old adage that social being was determined, social consciousness was determined by social being, it may be now that social consciousness is being more determined by social media which would determine, uh, which would have implications for new forms of organization and new modes of organizing that are required for social change, click. Definitely more attention to the relationship, the dialectic between humans and nature uh, so that we can embrace the problems of the natural environment within the center of the, uh, of the social and economic analysis particularly climate change and public health. They have to be fitted integrally into the framework for analysis of socioeconomic development and not as exceptions that you deal with as afterthoughts. Click. And for the countries in the, in the periphery, the challenge is how do you, how do you assess the, the change in balance between external and internal forces that are interacting on the economy and the politics, the society, the culture, everything about the periphery is impacted by these external and internal forces uh, and they, they interact with each other, but the shift, the balance shifts over time. It does require a lot of acumen and acuity um, for young an analysts. Click. <laughs> 
As an analytical framework, my view is that the center periphery system is still val valid, but it is being complexified by a proliferation of subcenters, many of which are subnational and possibly virtual. I mean, one has to recognize um, Silicon Valley as some kind of a center. Uh, and, and, you know, if you abstract from that even further, then um, you can see the point that it becomes much more difficult to comprehend uh, the structure of the global economy. Yet we have to understand the dynamics, the change in balance of power and influence so as to navigate our country's development through the uh, international trade, international investment, markets, and political relationships. Click. I think dependent capitalism is still a valid paradigm, but it must, we have to discover what the new content and what the forms and processes and institutions that sustain these social formations are in the current period. Click. Governance. Click. We have to reassess the inherited governance structures and the arrangements um, for their relevance and effectiveness. Click. The fact of the matter is that many of us, um, many of our countries accepted transitional government structures that were designed to manage and contain a colony uh, that so as to um, provide for resources for the mother country. Those governance arrangements do not facilitate the kind of flexibility and adaptability to respond to the needs for development um, in the modern period. Certainly, I think we have to broaden the democratic process. In the case of the Caribbean, the technology can help us tremendously in giving more voice to people all over the place, including the diaspora, and facilitating more meaningful participation with um, community organizations and you know, various organs of civil society. Click. We have to strengthen the efficiency and effectiveness of governance, pro governance processes. I suggest that one way is to find way is to, to delegate more responsibility with accountability, of course, to pub certain public sector um, servants. What we find now is that the um, decision making is highly concentrated in the public sector, and that leads to you know, delays of one sort or another. But it is important to recognize that we need mechanisms and processes that require and foster collaboration across the various branches of government. Many of our governments were set up around portfolio, um, portfolios that were limited to single categories. So there is a Ministry of Agriculture, a Ministry of Industry, a Ministry of Youth, a Ministry of this, a Ministry of that. Whereas the problems we are dealing with are all cross-cutting issues, environment, for example, um, um, youth and gender, um, poverty. These are all cross-cutting issues and the, the, the structure of the government does not allow for them to be comprehended. So we really need to rethink it with a view to improving efficiency and effectiveness. Click. The organization of production this is an area that I think economists in particular must pay attention to. My view is that we may need to encourage the networking of production units for especially for food processing and exports so that the small producers which are going to be with us forever uh, can achieve the benefits of large scale production while operating as individual units. Um, that requires a big discussion, but I can't do anything but mention that here. Uh, the technology again can facilitate real time um, networking click. Management of foreign investment on large scale production. And that's going to be very difficult to do, but I think it's absolutely necessary to pull them within the national production strategies. For example, we need environmental safeguards for wherever there's large scale mining, environmental and public health guidelines for tourism facilities and so on. And that's very difficult to think through how we do that in the modern era. Next. The distribution of income must be central, and the distribution of income is pre-conditioned uh, on the distribution of resources, particularly land. That land question remains in a serious problem in Caribbean development and many, many countries in the periphery. 
Land is important, but there is also access to government services and various incentives that have been monopolized by um, uh, traditional uh, poles of capital. Click. Economic growth is important, but it has to be inclusive. I tell my students all the while that we can get economic growth if we return to slavery. Uh, if that's not acceptable, then we have to find models of economic growth in which people are going to participate. And this way to rebalance the relationship away from growth alone as some kind of holy grail um, to growth with more equitable distribution. Click. And the regulation of principal markets, capital, labor, land, environmental services. We just cannot allow these markets to go rampant uh, in any development process that is going to be orderly. Click. Of course, modern statecraft is going to be necessary in order to manage them. Um, I think the technology, technological capacities are again, very important here, click. And to bring back human development as a central purpose of social and economic development, that seems um, quite um, self-evident. Uh, always strikes me to think of sustainable development. Uh, how could development not be sustainable? But th the reality is that many of our governments are focusing on artificial, um, artificial indicators that are just made up from somewhere else and imposed upon us so that we are you know, focused on getting the debt ratio, the debt to GDP ratio down, or you know, some some uh, some statistic, and uh, and which human development is secondary. The development issues, click 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 click, please click keep clicking. Yes, the traditional ones we know: poverty, inequality, um, human development, which depends upon education, health, housing, and security. Those are all the traditional ones, but the new ones are you know, even more daunting, you know, managing the impact of climate change. I mentioned to you that in the case of the small islands in the Caribbean, we are going to be inundated. And you, those of you from big countries who have just huge coasts may lose a little bit of your coastline, but you know, our societies, we can lose whole islands. Managing pandemics, oh, we see that now. So um, that becomes a problem of immense proportions going forward and shaping the forces of technology really to, to support the development efforts. Um, click. So to continue Sam's work, I think this is a challenge for scholars and artists, young of the new generation. I don't see many of them around, I must tell you the truth. It could be, it could be that I'm not looking or hearing the right things. I must say I was very encouraged by Amanda Gorman um, in her presentation last week, and I'm sure we have many, many Amanda Gormans in the periphery. Click. I don't think we at my generation has done enough of a good job to stimulate young people to develop the critique, but I think we still have to keep trying. Click. And in the broad, I think this requires promoting critical imaginations and research everywhere, click. That focuses on stimulating youth engagement in the development problematics. One of the things that we may need to do is to think of how we can do audiovisual research reporting, because that would have greater or wider audience and get perhaps more traction than traditional print, click. We have to re-energize the intercontinental scope of this institute. It's very impressive um, with comparative studies and inter and intracontinental dialogues. Click. And in conclusion, I would say that the Caribbean has many activist scholars who pioneered creative thought about the development challenges from whom young people can draw inspiration. Click. The African scholars even more recently have a, a excellent role model in Sam, as well as the older generations who Sam himself stood on, yeah, whose shoulders Sam, Sam stood on, click. Our scholars instinctively look outward because of how small we are, click. <laughs> 
Sam's example is to look outward as well to collaborate with others for the development of Africa. Click. And so I end with saying that I'm offering these ideas in, in, in the spirit of stimulating young people. And um, once again, what a privilege it is for me to, to walk in a way that will help to support the efforts that Sam made to deal with his beloved Zimbabwe. Thanks a lot. Sorry for the... Thank you so much, uh, okay. Michael Witter. 30 years of critical thought, followed by 40 years of embrace of neoliberal thought, and now to oblique criticisms of capitalism in SDGs, climate change, etc. Thank you for this really brilliant lecture, which has plotted the rise and fall of critical economic thought in the Caribbean, in analysis firmly grounded in the economists and societies of the Caribbean. This approach has enabled us to appreciate where ideas come from and why um, schools of thought prioritize certain concerns. It has been truly fascinating for me to understand signal developments in the Caribbean, the Grenadian Revolution and its demobilization and its uh, withering effect on, on left thought in the Caribbean, the struggles within the Manly Revolution and the basis and implications of the hegemony of structural adjustment policies and the Washington consensus for the Caribbean. In there are many experiences that have deep resonance for many African countries, as you've already said. I especially enjoyed your reference to the African roots of the intellectual traditions within the Caribbean and in your own intellectual journey. I was especially moved by the linkages you mentioned with the anti-apartheid struggles and uh, many of us were born in, 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 that, in that tradition. And um, also the engagements with Pan-Africanists and African liberation discourse, the references to Walter Rodney's powerful influence in, in, in Africa. As you pointed out, Arthur Lewis's thought has been greatly influential in economic development thought and practice in post-colonial Africa and in countries such as my own Ghana and I would add that members of the Lewis family also settled in, in, in Ghana. So this is a, a very strong uh, tradition. It was intriguing to hear you talk about Norman Gavin's interactions with Samir Amin and, and it would be good to, to know uh, more, more about, about this. I also thought that this focus on the cultural influences, reggae, Congolese music and so on, reminds us of a deeply human and uh, a deeply human enterprise in the cultural dimensions of our linkages across uh, global Africa. I think your lecture also pointed to, to me to the continuities and dis discontinuities in theorizing represented by radical critiques of giants such as Arthur Lewis, also the influence from other experiences from other parts of the global south, your, your, your reference to Carrie Levitt and, and to, um, to, 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 to uh, Singham and, 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 the, and the like. I think it, 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 whilst what you've been saying now may have been pioneered by and for, for small island economies, I think it's very clear that they are very relevant to all the other places with social formations like, like plantations. I also found that your lecture raised many questions and provocations. And I'd just like to mention two of them so as not to abuse my position as facilitator. Like many theories of his time, the plantation economy model focused on class and race, but appears to have ignored gender completely as a key structuring principle and a source of inequalities. This in my view remains a serious weakness in critical economic models. And I'd be interested in hearing what you think about this and how we can address this going forward. Secondly, you, you set out a, an agenda of future issues, which, which I found very helpful and interesting. It, it was very wide ranging. I would say that it relates more to an agenda of the national democratic revolution rooted in anti-imperialism than in an agenda of socialism. And, and I'd like to hear what you might think about this. There are two questions on the table already, and, and I'd like now to, to, to pose them to you. 
Max Agil um, says that it would be um, it would be wonderful to hear more about the interactions between Caribbean economic thought and what was happening at EDEP and the Third World Forum in Dakar. So that, that, that's, uh, that's question one. I don't know whether you got that. Basically asking to hear more about the interactions between the Caribbean economic thought and what was happening in EDEP and the Third World Forum in Dakar, basically referring to your reference to Norman Gavin and, and, and Sami Amin's uh, interactions. The second question is from Richard Lumumba. And he says, is it possible to explain what the left and Marxist thinking was, to explain that the left and Marxist thinking was denied sponsorship and the only option was to, and on the thinking about alternatives to, to, to neoliberalism. So, so there are a few typos, but basically, um, Richard Mumba wants your reflections on the fact that the left and Marxist thinking was denied sponsorship, and that the only option then was to support neoliberalist um, agendas. A third question says, if appropriate, would you talk about how Petro Carib, Carib fits in as part of the Caribbean Development Act, what question it raises, and what part the potential of the DLV, DVLP model between Bolivia and China around lithium suggests in the context of a failed coup in Bolivia and the increased agitation against China? Basically, um, many comments. Um, to, to, to this chat are talking about the, the, the lecture and its quality. Someone says, wow, thank you. Beautiful presentation, Professor, thank you. I thought I should share that as well. So this, you have the floor now to respond to, to these comments. Okay, thanks a lot. I, I'm, I, I'm happy for them. Uh, after four or five years of giving lectures, <coughs> I'm very reticent about <clears throat> pretending to do that anymore. I'm really hoping we just to share ideas. And unfortunately, I'll end up sharing more of the questions that bother me than the solutions that I find comfortable. So let's start with the question of gender. Yes, that was one of the areas that the plantation economists were critiqued. Well, what is interesting is that it spawned a uh, a uh, very active uh, feminist movement and feminist intellectual inquiry, both formally and in the cultural sphere. I point immediately to the world of uh, to the work of um, Professor Anna Ford Smith, um, who worked with a group of um, what we we call them. Um, special employment workers, um, per persons who got work from the government to uh, originally to clean sidewalks and so on. And what she did was to organize them into a theater group called the Sistrin. That is anybody's interested should try to research her work, Honor Ford Smith's work, Honor Ford Smith's work on Sistrin. Uh, and that then rep represents a profound social critique uh, and did that in a very popular format and therefore um, was far more um, penetrating than some of the more narrowly academic tomes that were written in academic journals, for example, that were not accessible to the ordinary people. So it, interestingly enough, I think that um, a, a lot of work was done in terms of I wouldn't say filling the gap, I would say reinterpreting the analysis to, to point out the exploitation of women all the way back to their role um, in slavery and, and therefore um, generating the, the work on the household economy. Now that is an area that is been stillborn. We just haven't had as much work done on it as is necessary. This is not to say that there are not individuals who do bits and pieces of it, but it is not in the center of economic discourse or social, social discourse as I think it ought to be. So um, 
I indicated that going forward, we have to try to understand the way in which the, the complex category of class, race, and gender functions in, 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 in trying to explain how society functions and therefore how to transform it. So I, I do agree that there's a big gap, but I must say that there is a lot of work done by Caribbean women on um, the, the gender dimensions of development. And I would I, I give you the name Anna Ford Smith precisely because she's a central figure and one can pick up um, the work of several other feminists that, that, um, that feed into her work. Okay, but there are many, many, many that um, uh, who have done some tr tremendous work. Uh, the Dakar, you know, it, let me tell you, I was a, a PhD student at the University of Wisconsin studying um, the growth of international firms. And one day I was cleaning the office of my advisor and I found on his bookshelf, a set of bound manuscripts, which were the original manuscripts of the plantation economists. I'd never heard of them. So they blew my mind. It, it was really a profound experience. The following week, I ran into the work of Samir Amin. So for, for, for both of those works to be juxtaposed in time, at a period when I was reflecting on um, my own PhD thesis, I, um, it was very profound. The connections were so obvious to me. And eventually it shaped my own doctoral thesis on the problems of export growth for a, a small economy. So my own work was in that framework. Now, I must point out also that I was trained by the person who I regarded as the foremost Marxist economist in the United States at the time. That was Donald Harris, Kamala's father. And so I came at the work very sympathetic to what Samir Amin was doing. Accumulation on a world scale. When I returned to the University of the West Indies, I engaged with this plantation economy school. And a lot of the dialogue among us stimulated uh, further research into the work that was coming out of Dakar. So that in fact, we had an international conference and Samir Amin came to Jamaica and many of us met him and his work was widely read. Norman Gerben in particular, who was certainly a senior scholar to us, but to my generation, um, he did a two year stint, I think in Dakar, in which he, he um, I think, um, improved the theoretical presentation of his original thesis on multinational corporations. So I think that the main connection has been through Norman's work and for a time in, to a lesser degree, uh, my work. I've never been there myself. That is one of the places I would have loved to go, but the winds have not blown me there. Um, one of the reasons that perhaps uh, Marx uh, left progressive thought suffered in the Caribbean was perhaps exactly sponsorship, both positive and negative. Positive in the sense that, you know, starving intellectuals got consultancies to do other things other than reflecting on development problems. Um, so there's a sense in which the, the money that came in with um, <clears throat> development projects <clears throat> pulled away a lot of intellectual power. Um, people were starving. 
Um, but at the same time, there was a repressive side to it where many of us who were in the left tradition were blacklisted by the Reagan administration and we're not allowed to do any work that was funded by American money and, and so on. So there was a both a positive and a negative side to it where people were encouraged to work on areas they were interested in because they, were, they got a little consultancy to do that in order to survive. And then there were those who of us who were essentially silenced in that world of technical reports. Uh, so yes, sponsorship was important. I don't know how important it is, but I think it would have to be one of the factors that explains the shift away of intellectual energy, away from critical thought into really problem solving. You know, how do you calculate the, uh, the, the poverty rate? Um, what is the impact of the IMF agreement on, on debt, on, um, on households, on employment, on children, concrete problems that were, were, were important, but distracted away from the larger theoretical issues, which in my view remain unresolved. And finally, the last question here is, oh, Petra Karib is very important, obviously from the energy point of view that it provided us with, uh, uh, it provided us with, with energy, but more important, it provided us with uh, funding because some of the arrangement was that we would hold some of the funds for development issues, uh, development projects. Uh, but politically, it was a way in which there was cooperation between the governments, um, Venezuela and Jamaica and so on. And it was in the tradition of Mr. Manley um, and the former president of Venezuela, Carlos Andres Perez, who saw the importance of building relations among our countries to cooperate as it were. And many efforts were tried to do a similar thing with Mexico. And we found that the US pressured Mexico away from those kinds of relationships. So Venezuela in a sense has always bucked the US hegemony and of course is, is paying the price for it. So it is important because it, it is a kind of model of how countries in the periphery can cooperate uh, for their mutual, mutual interests. Sadly, the, the arrangement has broken down. I didn't catch that. Could you try again? Quiet. Sadly, the arrangement has broken down and, um, you know, but it's certainly an example of the kind of cooperation that we, we in the periphery need to do in order to develop our countries. I hope that addresses the questions that I was asked, but of course I'd try to go even further if anyone is not satisfied. Thank you very much for, for those. The, the, the chat is very lively and there are four other questions. Um, first of all, I want to say that um, someone says, thank you for this brilliant presentation very inspiring. Um, Professor Shivji has a question. He says, thank you, Professor, for your great survey. One thought comes to mind, even in our critical thinking during the neoliberal era and in our critique of neoliberalism, we missed out the central problematic of historical materialism, both as a frame of analysis and also as the organizing dialectic of left politics. We paid lip service to class, but did not fully grasp the dynamics of class. Your thoughts, please. Question two is, thank you for your superb thought. How is the theory of plantation economy relevant to modern day neoliberal enterprise and perhaps to dismantling it? I'm reminded of Caitlin Rosenthal's accounting for slavery. The third question is from Boaventura Monjani. He says, I came late, but still could get the part on suggestions for younger intellectuals. Thank you. On the topic of organization of production, what do you think about the localized food systems and agroecology and food sovereignty? Also, what is your take on the issue of the growth, of degrowth 
for the global south. The third question um, is from Damien Lobos. Knowing that in the proposed genealogy, the focus is on CARICOM and the Africa-Caribbean link, I would like to see if there are aspects of the Latin American critical tradition that have engaged in dialogue with Caribbean economic thought. You have spoken about the case of the Cuban experience, but I'm thinking specifically of the Sandinista revolution in Nicaragua developed in a context of advanced neoliberalism in the 80s, which due to its proximity and class profile is very similar to the social structure that has char characterized for the CARICOM. Thank you. So those are the, the, the four questions I, 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 I mentioned. Well, I must say the last two have me, I have to think about them a little bit more. Yes, um, I know. <laughs> Professor Shiv, it's a, a, a great privilege to, for you to ask me a question, because I have learned a lot from your work. But I do agree that um, one of the problems with the development of the left in the Caribbean, in my view, was that it came at Marxism from political praxis and not sufficiently from the phys philosophical roots. So that um, in many ways, um, in, in its urgency to deal with the, the political issues, um, it tended to be somewhat uh, me uh, mechanical, in my view. There are others who obviously would disagree with me. But surely, I, I, um, I think that we have not paid sufficient attention to a historical materialist perspective I, I think I alluded to, to that um, with the point I was making about the dialectic between human society and nature. Uh, and, um, you know, it's very difficult to understand one's own ideology. It's, it's almost as difficult as trying to smell your own breath. And one of the things that I've been trying to do is to see what is it that I have been missing, that people who have, who have um, embrace the neoliberal thought, um, find so satisfying. What is it that I've been missing why so many people who were in the Marxist tradition or in, or in a more broadly left tradition abandon it and have become neoliberals? I, I don't know what was the epiphany, what was the transition that they made, but in my own way, I can't, I, I find myself coming back to, to the kind of natural way of understanding things that I, I found in historical materialism. So I would certainly agree with you that we have not, um, we have not understood it well enough. We have not used it um, um, properly in many instances, but I do think that it is, it, it is, uh, it, 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 it affords a basis for developing a, uh, a perspective on the development problematic today, though necessarily up, um, brought into the, the current period um, by the greater knowledge that we now have and by the change in circumstances that we have. But in, in many ways, it anticipated some of the problems, which is why I was able to suggest to you with some confidence that it, 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 it allows for the internalizing of the so-called environmental problematic. Thank you for that question. I need to think about it some more, but that is my initial response. Relevance of plantation economy to the neoliberal critique. Well, the plantation economy spoke to institutions. It was, very, it was rooted in the historical reality it identified the issues of dependence. Um, just to mention those alone, which persist today and have been just simply ignored by a ne neoliberal framework. It's not that they have engaged it, they've just ignored it. And by implicitly imposed a model of society on us, which is ahistorical. So it is in that sense that I think it is relevant. Can we use the framework as it is now for analysis today? I think we have to look at, you know, um, different levels of analysis. 
I don't think you can use Marxism to talk about um, the impact in the next quarter of um, Joe Biden's stimulus package. It isn't geared for that level of analysis. Similarly, the plantation economy is going to, not going to tell us um, what the, the debt to GDP ratio is likely to be in a year because of a particular investment project that is done. It, it wasn't geared to do that kind of thing, but it provides a framework within which we can develop the analytical tools to deal with short run adjustment problems and, and more you know, micromanagement of, of economies. So I think it, it has a lot of relevance, particularly in developing a perspective on the problematic of development that is relevant to not only the Caribbean, as I suggested to you, in the case of the Caribbean, the plantation was the dominant institution. What is the dominant institution in, in, um, in, in Zambia? It is the mine. What is the dominant institution in, Domin in um, Dominican Republic or Puerto Rico? It was the Hacienda. So what it does is says to you, look at the dominant institution historically and see what role it has played in monopolizing resources in the country and therefore depriving the citizens of the country of access to those resources. So in that sense, that one can make a case that it is still relevant. The last two questions I really didn't get very well. The one about food sovereignty, how important that is, I think is absolutely critical. And one thing the pandemic has done is to reveal that very clearly to us. You know, one of the things about being um, about the Caribbean in its role as um, hinterland, a hinterland of exploitation, as a, as a colony for exploitation, is that the people spent their time producing goods for markets overseas and therefore did not spend their time producing things for their own consumption. The result is that they have developed a habits of consumption of foods that we do not produce in the region. For example, we are addicted to wheat various in its various forms, wheat. We are addicted to dried fish imported. Now we need to transform that. And here in the region, we are very fortunate to have a, nature has been extremely generous to us in terms of the variety of foodstuffs and climates and so on like that. So I think it is absolutely critical and what the pandemic has done as the world war have done, as the great depression has done is disconnect us from our markets. And once we are disconnected from the markets that is when we are forced to turn inward to satisfy our basic needs. And that's where food starts right away. And of course, food has a lot more to do than just nutrition. It has a lot to do with the culture and so on of the society. So I think that's very important. I didn't get the last part of the question, but with respect to food so sovereignty, something, I think it's something about degrowth. Uh, I, can't, I, I, don't, I don't recall. And then the, the last one here is again, very difficult. What is the connection with Latin American thought? Well. You know, how do I respond? I mentioned to you that in the period of the 60s and the 70s and the 80s, there was a lot of exchange in around issues of dependency, structural adjustment. Um, we were very interested in the work that comes out of, um, of, of Chile, um, uh, Brazil, and um, to a lesser extent, Cuba. Parenthetically, Cuba was very interested in the work coming out from, from the English speaking Caribbean. Indeed, ironically, the first publication of Plantation Economy as a book, as opposed to manuscripts photocopied and shared a few papers here and there. The first publication as a book was done in Spanish by the Cubans only a couple of years ago. So they have been very important to us here in the Caribbean 
surprisingly, we learned a lot about how to deal with the IMF from the Cubans. So there has been a lot of interaction, more often at an informal people-to-people -people level. You'll be surprised to know how many Jamaicans live in Cuba. How many Jamaicans live on the coast of Nicaragua? And if not Jamaicans, people who fall within the Caribbean, English Caribbean culture sphere. So at a people to people level, there has been a lot of interaction. And that applies to certain scholars who have maintained these kinds of contacts. There are also formal relations between institutions. I was fortunate, for example, to go to visit um, um, Brazil. It was Paris Yeros who invited me to come to Sao Paulo first and only time I ever went. And out of it came all kinds of ideas of collaboration with universities. I came back, spoke to my vice chancellor. They were all excited. There were other initiatives. But what you find in a lot of these institutions is a lot of uh, commitments that are not carried through because of the tyranny of the immediate. The tyranny of the immediate is that they have to survive. And so that they may well want to you know, engage in long-term um, inter-institutional building, but mere survival, especially in the context of the structural adjustment and stabilization programs, uh, I, I think these deflect, these deflect, and, and it, it relates again back to the question of sponsorship. If the university is being sponsored to do some project for USAID or United Nations, it's not going to go path, uh, blazing the path to collaboration with third world institutions because that takes away its energy. So all of which is to suggest that there are many levels at which there's relationships between Caribbean thinkers and Latin American thinkers. Um, but is there room for more? I think there's a lot more that we can do and we can learn. One of the weaknesses in English speaking Caribbean is that we inherited the arrogance that we don't need to learn to speak anybody else's language. So we are here in the middle of a, a romance language world in which most people speak Spanish, Portuguese, or French, and about 6 million of us only know English. So fortunately for us, the, the romance speaking people very often can manage English and they help us to understand what they are doing. So we owe a lot to the people of the region and we have made our contribution in return. That's the best I can do um, with the questions as I understood them. I, I hope I addressed even a part of them. Thank you very much, um, Michael, for, for those um, answers. Um, we basically have seven minutes left, and in that seven minutes, um, that I would like to ask you one more question and give out a piece of information. Um, Kesten Perry says that she's tried to apply some of the plantation economy scholarship towards new problems here in a recent paper. So she, she has sent a link in the chat. So Michael, if you, if you are interested, um, you can take a look at, at that article. But the question that I wanted to put to you is from Vincent Kama, who asked that regarding the dynamics of class struggle and ultimately confronting the problematics outlined by Professor Witter, I think one needs a functioning collective brain for a class to be operative in history. The undermining of Grenada and other clandestine suppression by US agencies among various revolutionary organizations still continues. The world over shows, still continues the world over, shows the importance of clarity and principle on this front. So I'm curious about revolutionary working class organization in the Caribbean, and if there's any hope of a rekindling, thank you. So that, that basically will be our last question. Which is to say, why I raised the point at the end of the lecture, of social media shaping social consciousness. Because as elsewhere in the, in the world, the working class movement has been shattered in this period of time. Mm -hmm. And I think deliberately, of course. And um, for a country that was 
highly organized as Jamaica was up until maybe the 1980s, today the unions are extremely weak. There are no working class political organizations. And indeed, it is fair to say that, the, in my opinion, the worker consciousness is quite diffused. And I say that because um, in a sense, they are who they are. The working people are who they are and they see themselves as who they are, perhaps best sum summed up by Fanon's Le Damne de la Terre, those who have been excluded from the society. But the mode of organization is no longer let us get together and pursue our, our common interests. It tends more to be an individualist response. I migrate, I set up my own little business, I respond in some way as an individual. And so one of the costs, and, I, and this was my criticism of the IMF on their first mission, the cost to Jamaica is not going to be the debt. We will eventually be able to pay that. But the cost of these policies will be to shatter community organizations, will be to shatter working class organizations, and therefore leave the people without their collective voices. My own feeling is, is that that has turned out to be true. And I can say that the old forms of organizing workers probably are not going to work now. And it is up to the new generation to figure out new ways of organizing people around their interests um, using the various technological means that exist now. But it, to me, it is a sad part of the story of development in this period here, where collective forms of organization at the level of the community, at the level of workers, at the level of farmers, have really been shattered. Sorry to tell you that, but that's my view. Thank you so much for, for, for these last words. Um, look, it's been a really, really, really interesting afternoon, both the lecture and, and the questions and, and, and your, your, your answers to the questions have opened up um, many territories for, for us to examine. I think the organizers will send you um, some of those questions in writing. I think you, they will prove useful for finishing that paper. All of us cannot wait to see it in, in, in print and to engage with it further. So thank you so much for, for what you've contributed today. And I also want to thank our participants for showing up, asking all these interesting questions and basically making this fourth Samoyo Memorial Lecture a great um, su success. I, I have enjoyed myself and I think all of us have as well. And, and so we will bring this to an end in the next few minutes. And thank you and bye-bye. It's been great, bye-bye. Thanks a lot, viva Sam. <laughs> viva, <laughs> viva. <laughs> bye. Thanks, Bye. thanks, Mike, for a great talk and for uh, thank you initiating a lot of uh, very interesting ideas, especially for our younger comrades. So thanks very much. Thank yeah, it was wonderful. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, Michael. Thank you. Hi,